Good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clegg, and this is our midweek Bible study. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's. And if you will, be turning your Bibles to First Peter, the chapter 5. We're going to finish up First Peter this evening as we're getting up into the last part of it. But before we do that, we'll go through the announcements and prayer requests. Um, our Sunday school begins at 9 a.m. Um, and then services at 10 and we're continuing to transmit um, our service over the radio if you're parking sitting out in the parking lot um, this has really come in handy um, I know some different people have made comments to me about you know not feeling well and um, staying out there so they don't get somebody else sick which is all good um, and like I say um, if you really hadn't thought COVID was running rampant right now um, it has hit the plant at the back end of the plant as what we refer to it as um, we got nine people out in two departments that are right next to each other. So, like I say, um, that's going on right now. So, like I say, COVID's going around, RSV's going around, um, strep throat's going around, different viruses. Um, so, like I say, if you're not feeling well or you know, you can still participate and listen to the um, service in the parking lot. Um, so, we have that on 87.9. Um, Christmas card list. Is on the altar. Um, if you're going to participate in that, um, like say the lister is on the altar, um, turn in date is this Sunday. Um, so bring those in the boxes in the hallway. Hmm. Excuse me. Um, if you would help the people who are sorting the cards, if you would just keep them in the same order as the list and just rubber band them together, they'll be able to go through that quicker. Um, then also, we've kicked off our Lottie Moon offering. Um, the goal this um, year is $1,500. Um, walk down um, is December 31st, so we'll be doing that. Um, so, envelopes on the table as well as some reading information and prayer, re prayer guides with that. So, that's all available. Um, birthdays, um, December 5th, Ellie Bake. And then December 8th, Cynthia McMorrow. Um, so, we have those birthdays this, this week. Um, we have prayer requests, um, Miss Ruby, um, well, let's go through the list, Marianne Edwards, Jada Clayton, Karen Clegg, Karen did go to the oncologist um, this week, um, he didn't like the way she, her breathing sounds, so he's calling over to her pulmonologist as well, trying to help her get her in a little quicker, um, but he did um, put her on a stronger dose of medication um, until she gets there, so trying to help that situation, she just can't get a full breath um, with that, whatever you want to call it, glassy lung. Um, David and Connie Warren, Matthew and Jennifer Ward. Jennifer has surgery coming up in De um, later in December. I believe it's around the 14th. Mac McMorrow, um, Shane and Daryl Britt, Chloe Akers, um, Janet House, Billy McKenzie, Linda Cornelius Hunt, Frisch Family, Kyle Edwards, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Lee Stevens, Cynthia McMorrow and family, Ashley and Zaley Emmon, BJ Norris, Tommy Eford, Rosemary Taylor, Louise and Ron Rising, Melody Oakley, Excuse me. Um, Jennifer Milligan, Sheila Milligan, Hunter Kinlaw, um, Jim Miss Kelly, Ruby Johnson. Ruby has a touch of pneumonia. She is home, um, last word I got, um, but she does have a touch of pneumonia, so just keep her in prayer. AJ and Cheryl Barker. I understand AJ has a procedure around the 21st of this month, um, so keep him. Kathy Beanie is in the hospital. Hopefully, we'll get to come home soon, but. Definitely having some difficult times. Barbara Walters, um, Helen Rogers, Frederica Aswell, Lillian and Brutus and family, Mary Beard, Earl Davis, Dwayne Milligan, Jeanette Allen, Wayne Harris, Chase Andrews, Paula Terry, Tina Chasen, Derek Coe, Shirlene Hammonds, J.W. Gray. Um, Jack called me, I believe it was last night, and said that J.W. was going to get to come home. Um, so did not have to go to a rehab, was not going to go to another hospital. They were going to send him home. Um, he is battling cancer of a couple different types, so keep him in your prayer. And then also, remember the family of Bud Bird, um, our school systems, um, the children, um, the pulpit committee, church, lost nationist leaders, troops, and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their families. Um, like I say, Jack's brother's coming home. Jack has some appointment later this month. Um, remember his sister Pauline battling with cancer. Jamie Swartz has leukemia. Um, some different people traveling with appointments this week, and then also others that are just traveling, um, family and whatnot. So keep all of them in prayer. Um, Mike Alley, um, friend of 
Karen's family, a really close friend um, for years. Um, his home, his wife will be taking care of him. Um, and then Jennifer Ward, excuse me, um, the family of Myra Hagen, um, the family of Judy Cox, the family of Shirley and Smith, um, the family of Helen Barefoot. Um, then the one I mentioned Sunday, um, Dean Carter's son, Aaron, and his wife, Katie, lost their two-year-old son over the weekend. Um, no details about as far as what happened, just simply that he went to bed Friday night and they went to wake him up Saturday and he didn't wake up. Um, Two-year-old little boy, um, family is devastated. Um, so like I say, keep them in your prayers um, as they go through this difficult time. And then we got a wonderful praise report on Bethany. Um, she's doing well, um, beating what they're saying, that, you know, what they're expecting, so that's great. Um, then um, Daryl's surgery went well, so we're great to hear that. Um, so like I say, some good things are happening too. Um, a lot of times we get hung up on the negative. Um, so like I say, obviously um, keep um, the different wars in your prayers. Um, it's heating back up in the in the Middle East, um, as that war is firing back up, um, and some other skirmishes. And then also remember um, the Ukraine war. Oh, excuse me. For some reason, I just got the yawns. Um, not that tired. I just got the yawns. Um, with that, um, also um, different um, things happening um, across the world. Um, volcanoes erupting, some earthquakes have been felt um, the last day or so. Um, then they are expecting heavy storms again this weekend, parts of the U.S., um, which will cause some major travel issues and some danger. So just be in prayer for everyone. Um, also remember our churches um, as we're going through the holiday season, um, that the churches will focus on getting the word out is a good time to get the word out and it's a good time for Christians to really act like Christians um, and show people that during Christmas it's not about the gifts and all that it's all about um, Jesus Christ um, so we need to get that out there and show people that we care about them um, also continue to pray for the Samaritan shoe boxes I know we we're done with them and shipped them off but continue to pray for them as they reach their destinations short-term long-term I know some of them you know um, have shorter trips, others will have longer trips. So, like I say, keep them in your prayers as well. Um, so, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day and thank you for many blessings. And Father, we just praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we just ask you to touch all these lives that we've mentioned. And Father, we just pray for those on our prayer list. Father, we have those who are shut ins and others who are having difficulties due to illness and Lord we just pray that you'll bless each and every one of them Lord so they can get back up and go about and do their business and Father may those who are, who are limited um, and able to get up and about Father we just pray that you'll bless them Father may they feel your presence and Father we just ask you to watch over their caregivers and Father we also ask that you be with those who are battling various illnesses that are under the weather right now and Father we just ask that you'll Keep them close, Lord, and heal their bodies. And Father, we have others who are battling long-term issues. We have those who are battling cancer. Others that are battling with heart issues, some with lungs, some with diabetes. Um, there's other you know, muscle issues, bone issues, um, joint issues. Um, the list goes on. And uh, Lord, you know each and every need, each and every care, and each and every need. Every ache and pain in our bodies. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them. You'll bring about healing, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you'll be with our men and women who are serving in the military. Father, many are in harm's way. And Father, we just pray that you'll just watch over them and keep them safe. Confuse the enemy, baffle the enemy, Lord, that they cannot bring them harm of any ways. Foil their plans, Lord. And keep them safe and bring them home when their tours are done. And Father, we pray that peace can, pursu can persist and that these wars will come to an end. And Lord, we just ask that you will be glorified in all things. And Father, we just ask you also bless our men and women who serve and our first responders, 
our firefighters, our police officers, Lord, just bless each and every one of them. Keep them safe, Lord. As the roads get busier and things happen at the holidays, Lord, it just seems like their, their work just increases during this time. And Father, we just pray to bless them and keep them safe, Lord. May they make wise decisions and be protected, for they don't know what each call is when they go out to it. It can change in a moment's notice, so watch over them, Lord. And Father, bless our children in schools, and Father, we just pray to watch over them and help them in their schools. Keep the schools safe, Lord, as we've heard of recent violence. Father, may our schools be places of learning, growing, and maturing. And Father, we pray that the teachers and counselors and principals and all those, Lord, we pray that they'll lead the students in a good direction, Lord. We pray that they'll be good witnesses, Lord. We know that many of them are Christians that teach and serve in these positions. We pray, Lord, that they'll be able to show the children Christian love and point them in the right direction. And Father, we pray for our nation. Father, we pray for our leaders from the very top to the very bottom. Send them wise counselors, Lord. Send them those who will help them to be able to follow your will, Lord. Guide and direct them. And if they know you not, we pray. We pray for their salvation, Lord, for what a great thing it would be to be led by and have a group of leaders who are Christians that are leading this nation. And Father, we pray for the nation as a whole. We pray for this nation will turn back to you, Lord, that their hearts will be restored to you, Lord. We pray that there will be a stirring within them that they'll have a desire to seek you out, Lord, and to find your face. Bless them, Lord. And Father, bless all the churches. May we be good witnesses at this time of year and throughout the whole year. And Lord, may we show people the love of Jesus. And may we show them that the reason for the season is not the gifts and the giving, but the gift of Jesus, that the birth of Christ and our salvation that has come to be live among us. Emmanuel. And Father, we just pray that you can help us to be what you would have us to be. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless this time, bless us. Bible say, Lord, as we wrap up First Peter, and Lord, we just pray that we'll be able to do that, which brings you glory. And Father, use it in our lives and help us to grow closer to you and to lead others to you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Um, with that, like I say, turn to First Peter chapter 5. Um, we're on lesson 26. I can't believe it's taken us 26 lessons to get through five chapters, but as I've said many times, I'm not in a hurry. Um, some would say I'm long-winded, but I contend that there's no rush. Let's get all of it, everything out of it we can get out. And obviously with the commentaries and studies and all that I've been using, we'll be able to harvest a good bit. Um, so like I said, we're going to wrap up Chapter 5 this evening. Um, last time we started talking about three important admonitions that Peter gave the church to obey if they were to glorify God during difficult experience. This is something we don't think about. Just as, you know, when Paul was talking to us in Philippians about having joy in the face of, you know, danger and trouble and trials and even death, um, here we are, here's trials, here's fiery tribulations, here's, you know, all this that's coming upon them. Um, the persecution, and Peter saying, you know what, glorify God through it. If we would just learn to glorify God more, things would be so much easier. And like I say, we've got to give him praise. And like I say, it's hard to give him praise. And sometimes it's frustrating and things happen and all, but, you know, I'm thankful that, you know, God blesses me and, and blesses you. And like I say... Last night on my way home from work, my alternator went out on my car. got stuck um, over in Rayford, and I was trying to find somebody to j jump the car off, hopefully. I just thought it was the battery at the time and everything, and called back to the plant, and um, the numbers of the few people I had there, and they'd left. But one guy, you know, just a few minutes down the road, said, I'll tell you what, I'll turn around and come back. And he came back, jumped me off, and that was a blessing from God. He didn't have to. You know, I could very well have to call Karen to drive all the way from St. Paul's over, you know, with the other car to jump me off. Um, got back in town and, you know, was able to work um, things out and get the car into the shop today, get it repaired and all. Um, so, like I say, even though it wasn't what I wanted to happen, I took care of it. Um, was it frustrating to me at the time? Absolutely at times. You know, you, you're there, you're stuck, you're like, ah. But you know what? I'm very thankful that that man came back and helped me. I'm very thankful when I got here in town that I was able to get help um, to get the car into the shop right away the day. And it's just been a blessing. So like I say, it's to God's glory. Things work out. If we let them eat at us, we can make it worse. Um, so like I say, um, so like I say, Peter's helping us, you know, as we're 
he's preparing them, but we need to read it today because church is under attack today, um, as we well know. Um, the church age is coming to a close, so, you know, it's difficult experiences for us. And, you know, a lot of times in the U.S. we don't experience a lot of persecution, um, per se, as many do. Um, but there is coming, and it's growing, and we see a society that's not as friendly towards the church as it used to be. We see a lot of churches not being what churches used to be. And that's causing part of the problems. Um, the mindset is changing. Um, there's a, you know, so like I say, so like I say, we got started last week about the admonitions, and the second one that we're going to be starting off with this evening is um, Peter's telling us to be watchful. In chapter 5, eight, verses 8 and 9, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeketh whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brother that are in the world. Now, one reason that we have cares is because we have enemies. You know, and as the serpent, Satan deceives, as the lion, he devours. Um, the word Satan means adversary, um, and the word devil means the accuser or the slanderer. Um, and so the recipients of the letter, those who are receiving Peter's letter, um, had already experienced some attacks of the slander, which is referenced back in earlier in chapter 4. Um, and now he's going to discuss and talk about the lion. Um, in their fiery trial and he gives them several practical instructions to help them get victory over the adversary um, sometimes I think we we talk about Satan and some people are like oh he can't touch me you know I'm a Christian and others are like they're scared of him because you know he is Satan and they have this image of him that you know he's so powerful and that he will destroy him um, and then you have this other group that says oh I can handle this and then you have a group that handles it right and uh, <laughs> So like I say, um, we're going to talk about it and Peter's going to give us some in insight on this. Um, so like I say, we have an adversary. He is real. Do not think that the devil's not. We do not think he's just something of a cartoon. He is not. He is real. Um, scripture tells us about, you know, he was Lucifer, the fallen angel. Um, so like I say, so that's just, and this is one reason why I stopped where I did last week, that this all kind of runs together from here to the end. Um, with, the out, with the exception of the very closing um, of the letter. All right, your adversary, the devil, you should respect him. He is dangerous. Now, um, kind of put this in perspective. Um, there's different illustrations from different commentaries and whatnot, but I can kind of go firsthand um, with the one I'm talking about. You know, I had a good friend who has now passed. Um, he was an electrician. Um, he was a very good guy, and um, we had some electrical issues out here at the house. Um, we had lightning strike near the house, and the power ran into the house, did some damage to our electrical box, um, and then he was helping me get some wiring done because of where the wiring ran in. It ran, hit the building and came into the house. Well, now I had no power to the building, so he was helping work all those issues out for me. And so he was making a connection outside the house there, and I was holding things for him and helping him, you know, trying to be helpful. Um, and I set something down or got too close to something. And he's like, whoa, you got to be careful. And I'm like, what? I just said, he says, you know, electricity, you know, is very powerful. And, I, and you know, I'm like, okay, I understand that. You know, he says, but what we don't, most people don't realize is one of the most you know, used power sources, if you think about it. I mean, think about all the electricity we use in various forms, right? But he says, it's also the one of the most misunderstood or least known about. I mean, you know, we understand water and everything but you know why does one time electricity jump from this point to that point and the next time it doesn't why does it you know arc why does you know we don't have all those answers we can't predict and say it's absolutely going to do something um, you know I had a friend that um, I worked with and he said he was sitting in his living room and there's a thunderstorm outside and lightning didn't hit the house um, but he said all of a sudden they saw literally what looked to be lightning shoot across the room from, from one set of outlets to another set of outlets across the room. And he said it went about 20 feet. He said it literally looked like a lightning bolt went across the room, but he said lightning didn't hit the house. But evidently there was enough charge or current in the air or whatever that all of a sudden he saw this shoot across there. And he said it was the strangest thing he ever did see. Um, and like I said, I've seen electricity jump with sometimes you get working with different things you're like why does this keep shorting out and you know so electricity can be very dangerous and you know his whole point about it was you know 
he asked them, how do you stay alive? Because, like I say, I've seen um, the results or, you know, coming in, following some results from some very bad, uh, one bad accident um, at one of the plants I worked at. Um, an electrician was in there and was working on something, didn't do something right, and he got hit with a current that knocked across the room and burned him over two-thirds of his body. So, yeah, power, electricity can be very dangerous. Um, he can hurt you and kill you. So, you know, the thing that, you know, his point was, okay, yeah, I can work with this, but I respect it. I know there are boundaries, there are certain things I would do, and then certain things I won't do. And uh, so, like I say, understand your enemy. It's not you can't deal with the enemy, but you have to have respect for the power that he has and recognize that there is a danger. Um, so, in this case, like I say, you can handle it, but you have to know how. Now, when we talk about Satan is a dangerous enemy, he's the serpent who can bite us when, he, when we least expect it. You know, it's sort of one of those things. Um, and the serpents are good answer are a good description at times. You know, we saw them that in the Garden of Eden. Um, people keep you know snakes as pets. I'm not going to be a snake you know, keeper, but um, the one late I remember reading this story about this lady who had a big boa constrictor. She just thought it was the greatest thing, and it, it just kept getting bigger, right? And it was to the point that she was so comfortable with that she didn't keep it in a cage or anything. It was out at night and whatnot, and it actually would lay across her bed while she slept. Um, and so, you know, the snake just kept getting bigger, you know, a large snake. And finally, um, she got concerned about it because the snake stopped eating. And she's like, why did my snake stop eating? You know, it's, getting, it's gotten big and all it needs to eat, but it refuses to eat. And you know, so she consulted with, I don't know, I guess it wasn't a vet, but somebody else who raised snakes, and they were asking them different questions, and they're like, uh, you need to put that snake back in a cage or get rid of it. And she's like, what do you mean? The snake's always calm, it just lays there, it never causes me a problem. They said, no, you don't realize what that snake's doing. That snake's not eating because it's making sure it's completely empty. It is large enough that it, it will, at some point, harm you. It has now seen you as prey and is preparing yourself, preparing itself to eat a much larger prey, which if it's not in a cage and it's laying there around you a lot, it's you. And um, so sure enough, that was what was getting ready to happen and it was a danger. You know, it looked very comfortable. A lot of times we're very comfortable around the things that Satan does. Oh, well, he's just doing things. It's the ways of the world. You know, you don't see danger until it strikes. You know, you see lions and tigers and all, and as long as you can see them walking out across, you're all fine. It's when you don't see them or when they lay in wait, and you're like, oh, they're just laying down. There's no big Be careful. Um, like I say, so a snake is the same way. It, it doesn't always have to coil up in a coil to strike at you. There are some snakes that can lay, strike at you from a flat position. So Satan, you know, is dangerous. He can bite you. He can hurt you. And do it when you least expect it. Other names for Satan is the destroyer, an alias being Abaddon or Apollyon. Both means destruction. He is the accuser. Um, we'll see that um, in different parts of scripture. Um, is Satan smart? Absolutely. Is he powerful? Absolutely. Is he equivalent to God? No. Um, so like I say, is Satan alone? No. Um, the best way to think about Satan is he's the head of a great army. And um, he is a very formidable enemy. Don't joke about him or ignore him. You need to understand his ability. And in order to deal with him properly, we need to be sober-minded, meaning we need to be clear. We don't need to be, you know, off guard. We need to be, that's what it talks about, being vigilant, be watchful. Because he's ready to strike and he's waiting for that opportunity to let your guard down or you're not thinking that something's going to happen. Um, so like I say, be ready. Um, the problem of it is some people get so paranoid about it, they start seeing a demon behind every bush and they blame Satan for their headaches, their flat tires, and high rent. You know, we can blame Satan for a lot of things, but there's no use blaming him for most things because it has nothing to do with him. Um, he can inflict illness upon you um, and pain. Um, and seen in Luke 13 and 16 and in the book of Job. Um, but we have, and a lot of people get into this, and I know it comes out of the Catholic Church. There is a group within the Catholic Church that's supposedly supposed to hand, handle demonic possessions. Um, 
But really, we basically have no authority um, in Scripture that says we can cast out demons. Um, or excuse me, the demons of a headache or the demons of a backache. I don't know. There's nothing directly there. Did um, the um, apostles do this? And when did Jesus sent them out? Absolutely. But is, does he say that we as every believer have this ability to cast out demons? It doesn't say that. Um, so you're being very pretentious if you think you can. Um, so you got to be careful. Um, does Satan want to lure you into doing stuff that you shouldn't? Absolutely. Does he want to lure you into thinking you can do something that you can't? Absolutely. Why? Because you look the fool. And he'll make you look the fool. You know, and just show that, you know, how weak and worthless you are in comparison to him. I mean, understand, he is going to set you up to look good so that he looks good and you look bad. So that's the ultimate end. So that he can win people to himself and you will look like one who doesn't know anything and nobody wants to follow along with you. He's a, he's a deceiver. He's a greater manipulator and all. So we need, just need to be respectful of it. Understand, yes, he is powerful. He's very strong. Um, because, like I say, he's one of the archangels. He was one of the top angels. Um, but in dealing with him, we need to deal with facts and be very careful. We don't need to believe all these different things we see on TVs and some of these documentaries and all these crazy stuff or some of the crazy books that are out there. The best place to get information is the Bible. Get it from the source. Um, and we don't need to put our own spin on it or our interpretation. We need to literally deal with it straight from the Bible. Um, being a liar and deceiver, Satan can cause great confusion and misunderstanding of what we see and what we understand. He wants you to think that he's something running around with a pitchfork and red horns. He wants you to think that way. Why? Because then it, you start talking about him that way and everybody thinks you're, you're watching a cartoon. Um, so like I said, he wants the certain things so that you look a fool or you look like you don't know what you're doing or you, you overstep your bounds or think you can handle something when you can't. All that works to his advantage. All right. When we talk about Satan, we need to recognize him as a great pretender. Um, and what do we mean by this? Well, you know, he's a very subtle. He's very sneaky um, manipulator uh, and so we have to be vigilant and always on guard he's looking for those little ways to get in to get that foot in to get that hand in um, and his strategy is to counterfeit God um, whatever he does you know we talked about the Holy Trinity there is an evil Trinity I mean if you think about it you know the false prophet you know the beast and the Satan there's your false Trinity right so you know he copies God and mimics him, but not to the good. Um, so, um, if you think about the parables of the terrors, wherever God plants a true Christian, what Satan do? He plants a counterfeit or a false. Um, and he'll deceive us if we don't hold on to the word of God. And when we hold on to the Word of God, of course, obviously, we hold on to the Spirit of God um, with that. The better we know God's Word, the better and the keener our spiritual senses are to know when the enemy's about or when the enemy's up to something. Um, we can see his, you know, trademark, so to speak, or we see some things. Um, now, one of the things that commentaries talk about when we get into this set of scripture it talks about trying the spirits. Um, and what we understand is know what is a true spirit from a false spirit. Um, and 1 John 4, 1 through 6 gives us a little information on that to help us. It says what? It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is is is, is it in the world. Excuse me, I'll get my tongue tied. Um, ye are of God, Lord children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, we know God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
How do we try the spirits? By the word of God. It's nothing of us, but we just literally test them with the truths of God. Um, Satan is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So if you try to get him to state what the truth is, he can't do it. I know. Will he twist God's word? Absolutely. Think about Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, think every time that people had encounters with, you know, with Satan. He twisted the word. He tried to twist the word. So in this, what John's doing in this illustration, he's giving us some explanations and illustrations in these verses to help us see and know better what to do. We got to be careful. Um, so now continuing on with this whole discussion about Satan, just because we respect Satan's power and his ability, which we should, we are not to give in to him. We're told to resist him. A lot of people get a little iffy around this area, okay? If Satan is so powerful, if Satan is, you know, has all this ability, then people fear him and like, well, he can just flick me off like a flea, right? No. Not necessarily. And um, if you stand on God's word, if you hold on to the truth and you put on the armor of God, you are able to resist him. You can stand up to him. But if you cower in fear and flee and run, he wins. There's a time to run, there's a time to stand, right? So when we take our stand, we take our stand with the word of God. The word of God is our sword. It's the truth. And we need to refuse to be moved. Remember, we are only armed and clothed in our armor to go forward, not backwards. So if we turn and retreat, Satan can hit us in the back. Our shoes are made to, to help us to stand and get traction to go forward. Um, so, now, obviously, as I mentioned, the Word of God is a one weapon for us. That's our, you know, our sword. We have the shield. And you can go back and read different things about this. As we've talked about the armor of God, and you've read it before in different places. You know, go back into Ephesians 6, 17 through 18, you get some of this description, right? And so our armor and always our protection, the complete armor God has provided. And God gives us a way to be protected. See, a lot of times, well, God will take care of it. Well, God's already given you the way to be protected. And that is by putting on the armor of God. If you're not putting on the armor of God, how can God protect you if you don't want to be protected? He gives you something. It's sort of like somebody gives you a hose, you know, spraying water and say, there's a fire in front of you, put out the fire. And you say, well, you gave me a hose, you put out the fire. You know, it's like, you know, I give you what you need to put the fire out, and then you refuse to use it. God has given us the tools and the armor and all to resist Satan and, def and defeat him eventually in the right situations, and then we refuse. Don't go back to God and say, God, why'd you let him do this? Because he gave you a means to protect yourself. He gave you a means to defend, to resist. Um... So like I say, we resist Satan in faith. And that is our faith in God, not our faith in ourselves, not our faith in the world, not our faith in the, what our abilities know, our faith truly in who God is and what God has done for us. Our faith in God. Remember, David took his stand against Goliath. Shepherd boy against a warrior giant. And he stood there and he said, what? In the name of Jehovah. He stood and said, where? My strength and all this comes from my God, Jehovah. Not from the sling and the five little stones I've got in my pouch or the one, you know. It is from God, um, Jehovah. And that's where he took a stand against. And he was victorious. Our stand against Satan is who? Is in our trust in God, Jehovah. And all will be victorious in the name of Jesus Christ. Because there's power in the blood. But we can't stand there and say, I am who am I, and you know, and I'm gonna resist. No, you can't use your own strength. Now, it was interesting one commentary I point out here very quickly. Never discuss things with Satan or his associates. It is not up for conversation. As much as they may want to try to make you talk through things to deceive you, to trick you, or whatever, do not discuss things with them. I think a good proverb here to remember is, you know, in the one that's paraphrased, you know, who is the fool? 
you know think about it, you know when you're talking about who you know ask you who is the fool the fool or the one who argues with the fool if you think you can argue with a fool and win you're a lot you're foolish and you look more foolish than the fool um, so if you think you're gonna have a discussion with Satan the deceiver the liar the manipulator and win you're not being very smart I'm sorry that's like arguing with a fool you're going to lose every time because he is the manipulator, the deceiver, the twister of words and all. No, you need to stand on the word of God and it's not up for discussion. It's literally, here is the truth. Okay. And what do you expect to have to gain in having a discussion with Satan or his minions? I mean, what do you have to gain from it? There is no good that can come out of the conversation. You're not going to make a deal. You'll lose every time if you try to make a deal with them. No. There is nothing to gain. Sometimes there is nothing to gain by some conversations. They're just not worth having. And so, think about Eve. She'd been better off to keep her mouth shut and not talk to Satan. You know, because he twisted God's word and he got her not only to eat the fruit, but to give it to her husband, Adam. And Adam took it knowingly. That was how good the deception was. He heard this. He heard it is basically believed that Adam heard the discussion was there. And he too fell for it, hook, line, and, and sank her and took it and ate it. And then he turned around and blamed God because he ate the fruit because he gave her the woman. Also, never try to fight Satan on your own with your own, back, own will, your own strength. It will not work. Never do that. The last thing to remember is don't think you're the only one going through this. If Satan's attacking you, he's attacking others. His minions are attacking other people. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. So you're not alone in this. So help each other out. Discuss the issues and discuss what's going on. And encourage one another. And give each other scriptures and truth that you use in your battles to win over Satan. Because everyone's going to face these battles. It's going to come. Whether you knowingly or don't know about Satan and his affliction upon you or his battle upon you, it's coming. He's not going to leave you alone as long as you're trying to do what God wants you to do. If you're not trying to do what God wants you to do, Satan will have to worry about you. He's already won. He defeated you without even having to lift a finger. You just thought about everything that he's created in the world and the chaos and all and thought it ain't worth it. And he's won with you just thinking about it. He didn't have to lift a finger. I know. So in this, we also need, as we, we see others who are battling as well, pray for them, encourage them, help them. Share your victories because they need that encouragement. Just as their victories help us, we're, you know, we need to help them with ours. And we don't brag about our victories, but are to give God the glory. We are to give the glory to where the strength came from to defeat the enemy. He gave us the victory and how we followed his leading through these sort of things we need to share and say, God was telling me this and I, you know, didn't want to do it. I struggled with it, but I knew this was God speaking to me and I obeyed. These are things we need to share with each other and all. All right. Now think about Peter and we were talking about this because think about Peter lost a lot. I think a lot of times we don't recognize it, but Peter did. Had Peter listened to these three instructions, it's amazing how wise you get. Right. If you only known these things when you're younger, you could avoid a lot of trouble. Peter could have avoided a lot of trouble if he knew some of these things. Remember, he would not sl he he would not you know stay awake in the garden. Jesus asked him. He, he's like, I'm tired. Yeah. He, he put himself first. He now he didn't resist, and Satan was trying to make him go to sleep, and and all, and he lost, and he went to sleep. He couldn't even. You know, watch and pray. He, you know, he's like his ego, whatever you want to call it. I need some sleep and all. So, like I say, he was supposed to watch and pray, and then he didn't. And then, when they came to arrest Jesus, he got all upset and, and you know, angry and grabbed the sword. And when he did, he cut off the ear of Malchus, um, the temple servant. And you know, why? This is all part of God's plan, and 
Peter's like, no, this ain't going to happen. And I'm going to defeat Yeah, Was Peter going to defeat in whole army? No, he wasn't. He was wanting his will, not, not God's. And Jesus had to restore Malchus's ear. And finally, like I say, and both Peter and James um, gives us the same form. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's in James 4 and 7. Notice it does not say to declare yourself. That's not what it says. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. I don't resist Satan in the name of Steve. That don't work. Satan's going to look at me. He's like, who do you think you are? I know God. I know Jesus. I know the Holy Spirit. You? You're nothing. I don't know you. You know, I'm from the beginning, back when God created all the angels and you were there and ain't seen much of you. You know, so, you know, don't declare yourself. It's nothing to do with you. Um, many people tried to defeat Satan on their own and it'll fail. But, you know, when we stand before Satan, we must, you know, in order to stand before Satan, let me get this right. In order to stand before Satan, we have to bow to God. We have to submit to God because the reverse can happen. Peter didn't like what Jesus was saying during his walk with Jesus, and he resisted with Jesus. Mary said, No, Lord, that's not what's going to happen. And immediately, what did Jesus say to him? He said, Peter, he said, Satan, get thee behind me. He's telling Peter, you don't understand what's going on. You don't understand what has to happen in it all. You're, you're supporting Satan, not me. If salvation's to come, if the God is going to be glorified, then these things have to happen. You're wanting your will, not God's. And therefore, he was serving Satan, and he called him, Satan, get thee behind me. The next admonition and all is to be hopeful. Um, and this will wrap up the chapter, chapter 5, verses 10 through 14. But the grace, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he, ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying, that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's the end of our scriptures for this study. And so Peter closes on a positive note. Now he's been talking about, you know, fiery trials and being ready. And you need to do this. And he's bringing up some negatives. And not that he's trying to make people feel negative, but trying to help them understand how you know dire it could be. But he's going to try to, he, he re concludes on positive. And he's reminding his readers that God knew what he was doing and was in complete control. A lot of times we're like, well, God don't care. God's not here. And, all. and it's God's there all along. The problem of it is we don't recognize him. We don't see him. We don't hear him. We don't listen to him, and because we're out of his will, because we're focused on our own little pity party and our own little problems and doing it our way, we get ourselves out of God's will, so we don't know he's there. We don't recognize him. Just as we recognize Satan, we need to be able to recognize God. And also, God is in complete control. No matter how difficult the fiery trial may get, don't matter. Because he's there. A Christian always has hope. Peter gave several reasons for this hopeful attitude. And when I talk about Christian hope, I'm not talking about a wish or maybe. No, I'm talking about absolute. It's a sure thing. So Peter gives us some of this in these scriptures. We have God's grace. Our salvation is because of his grace. He called us before we called on him. We have tasted the Lord, tasted that the Lord is great. So we are not afraid of anything that he purposes for us. His grace is manifold and meets every situation of, of life. All these points have been covered by Peter in this letter. You can go back and look at these different things. 
<coughs> his graciousness, how he's done these things for us, and he set up the situations for us. All this is here in Peter's letter. And we can go back and read it and study it more. And we understand that as we submit to God, he gives us the grace that we need. And then, you know, we talk, look at different scriptures. How does it go? He is the God of all grace. He, he has grace to help in every time of need in Hebrews 4 and 16. He giveth more grace, James 4 and 6. And we must stand in that grace, 1 Peter 5 and 12. We have God's grace. Do not let the world get you down. Do not let Satan get you down. All right, then it goes on. And Peter reminds us that we... Um, no, we are going to glory. Are you sure we're going to heaven? Absolutely. Every Christian should know where they're going. They're going to spend eternity in heaven. Um, and so what he's called, he's called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. This is the wonderful inheritance which we are born into when we become a Christian. And you know, whatever begins with God's grace will always lead to God's glory. Psalms 84, 11. If we depend on God's grace when we suffer, that suffering will result in glory. And you can go back and look at that as we studied previously in 1 Peter 4, 13 through 16. You know, the road may be difficult, but it leads to glory. And that is all of what really counts. Now, various trials, Peter addressed back in first, um, chapter 1. You know, various trials are only for a season. They're not going to last forever. Only for a period. But the glory that results from them is going to last forever if we go through them right, right? And Peter had this same thought in mind when he wrote 2 Corinthians 4.17. These little troubles, which are really so transitory, are winning us a permanent, glorious, and solid reward out of all proportion to our pain. We're going to feel some pain. We're going to have some inconvenience. We're going to have some troubles. And, all, and that's all fine and good. And Paul's reminding us, but it's all good. Because we're going to go from this temporary pain, this short-lived pain, to a wonderful permanent solution. A wonderful, great thing. All that proportional to our pain. God just knows you're going to say, oh, well, yeah, you get it. No. He's going to reward you accordingly. All right, next. We know that our trials build Christian character. Wow, this one just struggles. People struggle with this one. They think about trials, they think about problems, they think about pain, they think about all these negative things. Going through these things builds Christian character. In this, the translation really comes out, makes you perfect, means to equip, to adjust, to fit together. It is translated mending nets. It's really, you know, you're talking about going out and you're fishing and your nets get torn or whatever. It's talking about mending nets and all. And God has several tools that, he uses to equip his people for life and service. And suffering is one of them. We're like, wow, well, I don't like that tool. Use a different one, God. No, it's part of it. And so, the Word of God is another tool. This is expressed in 2 Timothy 3. And then, um, and that goes on to the same thought of being thoroughly furnished or fully furnished, um, meaning fully equipped. Um, some people, some places you'll see scripture saying being perfected, meaning that we're complete, not perfect in the sense of perfect, but complete and ready. We're equipped to handle different things. And then so also he uses the term fellowship ministry of the church in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Our Savior in heaven is perfecting his children so that they will do his will and his work. And that's over in Hebrew. So, you know, this whole thing of trials and tribulations and all are to build our Christian character so that we can do the things that we need to do for God and be stronger. And I've mentioned to you several times, you know, before Karen got cancer, before that, there was different things that happened. And there were little things that strengthened me and strengthened me and strengthened me and strengthened her. We didn't know what was going on at the time. We just like, and so now, and people will sometimes think I'm callous. I don't really mean to come across that way, but I can be, I guess. And all the something happened to Karen, and I'm like, yeah, we have this going on, and you know, I'm not worried about it. You know, God's got it; He'll handle it. And they're like, well, you're just being very nonchalant about it. No, I've been through a lot of fiery trials with her, and guess what? God's done every time; He's brought her through it. So I've seen Him bring her through some very tough times, very rough times. 
You know, like I've told you before, I've been told three times she should not be with me, but by God, the grace of God, she is. I've been blessed. So this tells me that God is there and God is working. So when things happen, I don't have to panic. I don't have to fear. I don't have to have this, oh, this is horrible. You know, I've had those moments years ago. I've had my tears and my crying out to God and all. I've went through that. You know, that's growing pains, maybe you want to call it. But God answered it, God handled it, and God showed me. And now I can sit there and say, okay, God's got this. No, no. I'm not, I don't have to overreact. I don't have to worry about it. God's got this. So like I said, character's built. And we go through these smaller trials, and the trials can get bigger. But we're able to do this because we grow and mature. And God's going to be with us in every part of it. Now, the next term that's used is established means to fix firmly, to set fast. Christians must not be unsteady people that waver about in their stand for Christ. No, we have to be solid. We have to be anchored. We have to be steadfast, right? And we need to be established. Our hearts need to be established. And you can read scriptures in Thessalonians and James about this. And we have to be accomplished um, by God's truth. That's back in second. We'll see that later in Second Peter and all. The believer who is established will not be moved by persecution. If you are established, you will not be moved. Be moved. Be moved. Um, and you won't be led astray by every false doctrine that comes along. There's people that would say, oh, you can't do that. No. Test them. Show me where you get that out of Scripture. Show me where God said that. Show me an example in Scripture about this. And when they start showing you, you really make sure you look at it because some people take God's word and twist it up one side and down the other. All right, so be ready for it. So establish yourself. Be fixed firmly in God's word and God's truth and in Christ. Be ready. All right, and then the next one says strengthen and all means we, just that. I mean, strengthen is a very obvious one, right? God's strength given us to meet the demands of life. Things happen, and if we rely on our own strength, we'll fall. If we rely on God's strength, we'll stand and we'll move forward. And also make sure you have God's strength and not yours. You know, because our strength is not enough. Our strength is insufficient. And then the next one, you settle is the translation of word. It means to lay a foundation. Um, there's different foundations of houses around the world. There's all different types depending on where you live and the ground and everything else. But the whole thing about a foundation is when you lay it, and you put it down that when you build upon it, it will not crack or shift so that the house will stay steady and level. You know, and your foundation won't break and get cracks in your wall and cracks in your foundation and all. The foundation is supposed to be upon settled earth you know, and be solid. You know, so, you know, our foundation needs to be Jesus Christ. It's Jesus ain't going to move. God's word's not going to change. You know, we need to have a solid foundation. Otherwise, we're like what Paul talked about, being tossed about with every changing of the wind or breeze. And that's no witness for Jesus. That's no witness for God. All right? When an unbeliever goes through suffering and all, he loses hope. When a believer goes through suffering, his hope increases. And you say, that don't make sense. But you have to understand, going through this, you know, not you know, if we go back and read some scripture out of Romans 5 it says not only so but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that the suffering produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope as we go through these trials as we go through these persecutions and all these are the things that come out of it so that we are stronger so that our character is better so we get a blessing from it and also that our hope is more because we are assured God brought us through these things. He'll continue. And so our hope is in God. And it's an affirmation. God can do this for me. He'll do this again. Or he'll do even better. All right. So as we go through these things, it builds us. And so that we can rely on God more. But the bottom line is that we give God the glory forever and ever and ever. All right. The next thing, and you know, we're wrapping this letter up, and this is what this commentary and um, study was showing, 
you know, Pete, Paul always ended his letters with a benediction of grace, um, such as in Second Thessalonians 3. Now, Peter closes his epistle with a benediction of peace. Um, he opened his letter with a greeting of peace, so he, so the entire epistle points to God's peace. Um, so that, you know, you think about peace or God's peace, you think about First Peter. Um, and it's a wonderful way to end a letter that announced the coming of a final trial. Peter's like, oh, we got all this coming at us, get ready. And then he turns around and, you know, God's there. Get ready, hold on to God, and you'll go through it. So Peter's telling us there's a peace. And we can have a peace going through trials. We can have a peace with God, a peace with our situation, and go through these trials. <clears throat> so like I say, in this, we also see, um, Peter uses the term, um, now, four times in the New Testament, we'll see the admonition about a holy kiss. But Peter here calls it what? A kiss of love. And keep in mind that in that day and age, in that part of the world, it's custom, and there's still customs similar to it today, um, that, you know, men kiss the men and the women kiss the women. And in a, what is called a kiss of love, a kiss of affection, not something of sensual or sexuality thing. But it was a greeting. It was a turn of affection. You're my great friend, you know. And we see a lot, you know, kiss on each cheek or in a hug, you know. Um, a lot of people in the United States get very, you know, um, nervous when they see men give, you know, men hugs. And I've seen men that won't tell other men that they love them because that thing can be misconstrued in some way. But, you know, I'm, I've learned to get over that. I mean, it's, you know, a thing that you have to. And so what I have people say, I understand it's in Christian love and all, but a lot of people, oh, I don't, you know, no, don't let the world destroy something good and all. We can express our Christian love one towards another in that we can give each other a hug. I mean, sometimes some men just need a hug. I mean, they're going through grief and agony and sometimes somebody just got to hold on them. I've appreciated it when, you know, I've gone through some tough times and, you know, a, a, a strong Christian man grab hold of me and say, I've got you, God's got you. Sometimes you physically need a reassurance of God's arms around you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, don't get apprehensive about that and all. And I've also seen it done the wrong way. So, you know, um, in the same way um, with women, I've seen, you know, you, you, can, you can hug women, you can not hug women. There's a right and a wrong way. But this is a greeting or I should say a benediction, a ending to a letter, you know. He says, a kiss, I send you a love, a kiss of love. It's a term of, I love you as a Christian brother and sisters. You're my family, you're, you know. And, you know, I think about, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, I used to give my mom and dad a kiss goodnight, all right? Rachel to this day will still walk by, by me at the chair and does what? She gives me a peck right on top of the head. Good night, dad, love you. You know, it's a kiss of love. It's, it's, it's a term of affection. Nothing more. And Peter's like, that's the greeting. That's the send you. I send you a kiss of love. You're my brothers and sisters, you know, I love you. You know, and we need to see that. And the thing about it, and you think about it, and this is why we got such a distorted view in our country because of what has happened in our history. Even in that day, Christians who were slaves and who were masters still greeted each other in this way. Imagine a slave or someone who is under the your bondage of somebody else. And remember they had indentured servants, they had bond servants. And also they technically were slaves and all. But they would greet their master in this way and the master would greet them in that way because they were Christians. They could greet each other that way in their love of Christ. So like I said, Peter's giving us this precious letter, and I think what we're going to do, we're just going to jump right in and probably go right down into Second Peter um, going forward with our midweek studies, um, unless I take a brief excerpt um, just to do something else. But right now I'm thinking that's where we're going. Um, but I never know until we get there sometimes. Um, but like I say, this is a precious letter. It encourages us to have hope in the Lord. We're going to have adversity. We're going to have trials. 
and the church is going to be under affliction. Yeah, we all know that. It's under that today. We're going to experience these things, and Satan's going to try to attack us and attack the church and destroy us, and we just have to be ready for it. Don't let your guard down. Be watchful. You know. But whatever may come, Peter is still saying to each of us, be hopeful. The glory is soon to come. Be hopeful. We know how it ends. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that you know what your end is. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Father, we thank you for this wonderful letter of Peter. It tells us to be hopeful. To be ready for persecution, to be ready. And all do not let our guard down. The enemy is upon us. Be diligent, be prepared be obedient, be in truth, so that you're ready. Father, bless us as we go out. Watch over us and keep us. May we share the true meaning of Christmas to those around us. Keep us always close, Lord. Forgive us where we sin against you, Father. Until next time, we praise your holy and blessed name. Amen. God bless and have a good night.